way that, that Mary J. Blige is using a hip hop soul aesthetic to rewrite how we even discuss violence as a people. And what does that violence, what do we do with that violence when we can't so neatly fit it into a package of state, state sanctioned violence against black and brown bodies, but really what happens when it's intimate partner violence and your partner is a man of color or a woman of color you know what happens what do we do with it when that person who is sexually assaulting you or violating you is a member of your own family right so what what how do, how do we how do we deal with that type of violence and i think that there's a way that mainstream hip hop and r&b was not really ready or trying to deal with the type of violence that Mary J Blige was forcing us to confront in the early 1990s but i think that in in the way that she does that she's evoking what Angela Davis refers to as a protest consciousness and it's a consciousness that she very much ties to the blues women um, of the early 20th century that there's a way in which there is something political about the way that Mary J. Blige and the blues women are singing about love relationships, about violence, about intimate partner um, violence, and what that looks like and what it means and the type of harm it causes for the black community as a whole. So for me, when I'm thinking about how she's using violence to change the hip hop landscape, I think that it's it's somebody like a Mary J. Blige that makes it possible for a Kelly Rowland to then sing that dirty laundry song. Like when she talks about her her relationship with a partner who was violent towards her and how it alienated her from her friends and family. So I think that the Mary J is really doing something that's important for our generation in terms of how women are experiencing and writing and performing um, experiences related to violence. I mean, I think that's a really great entry point for you, Emily, in terms of the blues woman aesthetic. Oftentimes when we think about blues women, there's a particular type of secularity associated with sexuality and pleasure. We're coming to you, Treva. Pleasure. <laughs> um, that, you know, really kind of makes a makes room to complicate what black womanhood scripts look like in the 20th century. Um, you know, in your research that you did with your, your first book, you know, I know that you, you address some of these concerns with the blues aesthetic and women performers. Um, would, what are some of your thoughts on the ways that Mary J. Blige is kind of continuing or even departing from that trajectory of black, of black women's blues aesthetics? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great question. And just to follow up a little bit, too, on some things that were said before, you know, I'm thinking about her own insistence upon not only this more kind of... Um, spectacular public violence in that moment, but also the intimate violence, you know, as Tanisha has said, as coming out also of a literary tradition, you know, that we might associate with Toni Morrison and the bluest eye, right? And that sort of intense um, scene of incest that in fact sort of drives, that's the, the central crisis of that novel, you know, thinking about also Antisake Shange and some of the stories that she's telling about this intimate sort of violence and hurt and also of course healing, right, in for color girls in the ways in which both of these women are, you know, kind of really um, critiqued for quote unquote airing the dirty laundry, you know, of black communities in that moment. So I see Mary J as sort of continuing to insist upon the importance of telling these stories, again, um, in the interest of healing, right, in the interest of reconciling. Um, and in that way, yes, extending literary tradition as well as this, the blues woman's tradition. So the blues woman's tradition, as I kind of understand it, is, is in part about expressing a whole range of complex emotions, right, about expressing pain and hurt, but also performing the resiliency that allows you to sing about that pain and hurt, right? Because if you're able to kind of sing about it and even use some of the comic humor and timing that people like Betsy Smith and Ma Rainey would be using, then you're already showing that you are surviving, right? You're moving on. You're expressing an experience of a, an I that, as scholars understand, you know, is also an experience of a we, right? And so you're modeling both that ability to be vulnerable, but also the way in which there's a certain strength in, in being vulnerable, right? And it's a strength that you are um, also extending to others, right? And trying to help them through their own things. And so I can see that certainly with Mary J, you know, that range of emotion that she is able to express even on a single album like My Life, and also her real commitment to not just sort of performing this confession that's supposed to be therapeutic for her, but also explicitly supposed to help other people, right? And I mean, she speaks about her work, of course, you know, as, as a ministry, right? As really ministering to people. And so I think that my life, that, that particular even title track is interesting in that regard because it's about her life, right? Um, 
but it's also it's also designed to help other people through theirs. You know, on these lyrics, you know, if you don't believe in me, believe in he, and things are going to get better for you. Um, I, I see that as as very much a part of a kind of blues woman's tradition. That's great. Uh, Dr. Lindsay, I want to I want to come to you for a second. Um, when you're talking about this idea of reclamation of self, reclamation of sexuality and joy, and of course, you know, I had to come with you with the pleasure politics. Um, and you know, my life necessarily isn't a a uh, for lack of a better terms a pleasurable side of the pleasure <laughs> politic. Um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about you know how can we read the My Life album as a pleasure narrative? Um, and and all you know in in terms of thinking about the ways in which black women's sexuality is starting to take shape at the end of the 20th century and continue to propel us way into the present. Yeah. Um, so, all right, here's the thing, right? My life probably is not the album you want to turn on to, like, get your thing popping, right? So I, I get that. It's not <laughs> necessarily that. And that's cool because um, I, I think we take artists as their body of work, and I think she has provided some tracks. I don't know that Mary's necessarily ever been – the artist that I think about when I think about like getting it in and this kind of sexual pleasure sensibility. Mm -hmm. But I will say on the song, there are always these songs on her album that do have a very decided sexual politics, however heteronormative it may be, um, about satisfying partners and, and doing something, whether it's Love Without a Limit, um, you know, that's definitely has sexual over and undertones from what's the 411. But all my life, you do get, Mary Jane, you get all night long, right? Come into my bedroom, honey. You know, it's that, like, yes, come in. What I got will make you spend money. Like, what? Okay, yeah, all right. So I think having that part in the album, right, the, the, it's a complexity of emotions, as Emily was saying, that there's a range of things that she's signifying on in the soul tradition that's signifying in the blues tradition. And... These are all experiences, and saying that even at our most subjugated moments, at our most vulnerable moments, at our most terrorizing moments, um, that the desire for pleasure, that the articulation of pleasure still becomes a, a moment, even if ephemeral, that we can harness and hold on to. That that is a space that actually offers some sense of joy for her, mm -hmm. even amidst this album. So while you're searching to be happy doesn't mean in the meantime you might not have a, you know, you might have a couple orgasms and that might be all right, you know, um, that that might be part of the project moving forward. And I think her talking about that, having a song like on that, uh, on there like that does offer my life something that allows it to be beyond just the album that tells you the deep, dark secrets of Mary J. Blige or the deep, dark secrets of being a black woman at the end of the 20th century. I think it offers something about complexity, about it being complicated, about pleasure being part of the project. And that being happy, um, finding love, finding pleasure, finding joy, um, and what brings you joy are all part of the liberatory project that she's invested in. Mm. Because you go from, what's the 411? So we get some of the story as told as by others as performed by Mary. You get my life as told mostly by Mary and performed by Mary. And then the next album is Share My World, right? This idea to then go in, not just my life, but it's this sharing and this more collective sensibility that emerges from that. You take that all and you still get from there, love is all we need is on that, all that I can say, right? There's this movement around joy and pleasure that's happening across the world that allows for us to see that getting to pleasure and joy and evoking that kind of politics is a process and it is something that's, an, that's unfolding for us and the possibility of that and that marrying of the sacred and the profane because my life has decidedly religious tones, right? And then you have something like All Night Long, but then you have Be Happy, which samples Curtis Mayfield and samples Marvin Gaye's I Want You, right? So, I mean, there, there are these obvious texts, and both of those artists negotiated real tensions between the sacred and profane, and we typically think about that conversation in terms of soul men and not often in terms of black women artists. We don't often give them that complexity when we do our readings of them. Emily, do you want to uh, jump in here in terms of, you know, this idea of not necessarily, well, it is, it is an extension for me, I'm, I'm thinking, in terms of pleasure politics, in terms of joy, not necessarily the sexuality, but the search for one's self-definition through 
joy and pain. Um, and Trivia was mentioning, you know, the connection between the Soul era and the samples that she uses on the album. Uh, this, but I mean, like the soul, the soul aesthetic itself is particularly interesting because oftentimes we don't think about women's, we don't think about women's contributions in terms of the production itself, but rather the impact. Um, so, you know, what what are some of your thoughts on the connections that uh, p possibly the samples that she's using, or even uh, some of the performance aesthetics that she uses, are are putting her in conversation and bridging these two ideas together? Yeah. So, I mean. That, what, what Shreva said about the way in which the soul tradition, what you're saying too, about the way in which the soul tradition has generally been coded as male, right, is this sort of hyper-masculine space of the soul man that Mark Anthony Neal writes about so, so well in Looking for Leroy. And I mean, I think that Mary J, you can see her contesting that sort of masculine or male coding even in her decision to cover Aretha Franklin's You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, you know, it's like a bonus track on my life. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the samples, too, you know, I mean, I was thinking just about what Triva said about how it's not just about those sort of deep, dark secrets that she is revealing. And that, in fact, what's so cool about my the title track, My Life, is that even as it seems that she is, you know, expressing this truth about her own life, you know, to help others and all this stuff, is that she's doing so through a, through a quotation of the Roy Ayers song, you know, um, about the, the sunshine, right? Folks sit down in the sunshine. And so she's revising that particular, you know, 1976 um, beautiful soul track. In, in Roy yeah. Ayers' version, you know, it's like bees and trees and everybody's getting down. And, like, <laughs> it's fun. Like, it, everything is good. And you need that, too. I mean, as she was saying, like, the idea that Mary J ends my life with the declaration just, I want to be happy, and that that is a worthy sort of telos for this album, right? That's, what, that's a worthy place to want to get to. It's just, like, let me be happy. Um, but anyway, in my life, she does revise that. And it's kind of like, this. my life is different from the life that is being envisioned in that Roy Ayers song. Um, but it's also showing us how artfully, in fact, she is expressing her life experience, right? The idea that she's doing so through a quotation, through this prior um, sort of musical text. And I think one thing to say about that is that in that sense, she's sort of acknowledging the extent to which our most sort of personal expressions are always mediated through some prior expression, you know, that we're always working in some ways in a tradition coming out of other people's musical expressions, you know, that we, of course, revise, but also really use to sort of guide our own way. And so we could also think about her samples of Curtis Mayfield in that regard. I think of Curtis Mayfield exactly as a sort of almost like secular prophet, right, um, <laughs> who was insisting that salvation is going to be of this world, right, that salvation looks like justice in this particular moment in time. And I think it's so so interesting that she decides to sample him because it's sort of like he is a prototype of the kind of ministry, the kind of secular healing work that she herself would do on that album and especially sort of go on to do throughout her career. So, I mean, I can talk about her soul samples forever, but those are some of my, um, <laughs> some of my primary thoughts on that. Right. Which is also really great hip-hop, right? Like, it's like yeah. the sampling. Like, noticing why Mary J. Blige fits into a hip-hop distinctively aesthetic right. is like, what she does with remix and sampling and choice, like the kinds of things she samples over. And in my life, it's more soul samples, whereas on What's the 411, you have, you know, Audio 2 Top Villain, like, you know, this very familiar track within hip hop um, and MC. So where she goes with the samples, the body of work, and then what she does as covers and not just samples. I mean, there's something so hip hop about that engagement and something deeply tethered to black traditions of invention, reinvention, remixing, collage, and sound that's in there, their Mary J. Blige absolutely taps into. People just be sleeping on Mary. I'm sorry. Like, there's just so much there. They there's sleep so on Mary. It, they sleep on Mary, and they also sleep on that whole Uptown Records moment. Oh, my goodness. You know, really, and how, how so when you have Mary playing around with all these samples and how she's using sampling, it's really part of that larger Uptown project. You know, yes. where you have Andre Harrell trying to reinvent himself, you have Diddy trying to make it for himself, you know, and, and produce a sound that really is uh, representative of, of how he's seeing hip-hop and where hip-hop is going. Um, you also have this moment where um, Mary J. Blige and, and 
Jodeci, I mean, KC, her her longtime um, lover, where they're on the same record label, right? So there, there's this whole dynamic about this whole, with the whole Uptown family that includes people like Mary, you know, Jodeci, Heavy D and the Boys, Christopher <laughs> Wilson, you know, it's like this whole cadre of people in, in, in this one particular moment, Uptown is thriving. I mean, they're setting the standard for what this mm. hip-hop soul amalgamation is going to look like mm. as we, you know, move from the, the mid-1990s into the, the turn of the 21st century, into the new millennium. And so I think that it's important to really situate her on this particular album, um, record label, yes. and what that label is trying to accomplish and how she becomes, in many ways, the first lady of Uptown. You know, like where, where her music is really um, providing that counterpoint. And so there's a way that we, we've, we've created all these models to understand what record labels like Motown are doing and how they're using, how they're positioning people like uh, uh, Diana Ross within that context. But it's really interesting to think about what Uptown is trying to do with Mary J and how they've really taken her from being the, you know, the lead background singer, if you will, on a Father and C album to now being the front lady on her own, her own albums and even like the the front lady for this this um, record label so I think that 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 broader moment for me is really interesting to think about how they're using sampling over there at Uptown yeah well, no. I wanted to come back uh, come to you for the for this next part because when you're talking about presentation and 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 historical moment uh, you know I had to pull on your expertise as fashion you know so I know I got other fashionistas on the panel but I know that you're your work is particularly <laughs> interested in, in the connection between agency and fashion. Um, she introduces a really interesting moment in, in hip-hop fashion. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, you know, for the longest, I wanted, like, the Pocahontas braids. You know what I'm saying? Um, I couldn't dye my hair. You know, my mom wasn't about that life at the time. She was like, <laughs> I'm like, let me be great. Um, but, you know, I mean, she had the, you know, she had, like, the leather hats, and she had this, just the, the whole kind of like sexier hip-hop vibe, if you will, you know, um, why don't you start this part of the conversation, what is the, what is the significance of fashion and how we remember Mary J. Blige during this My Life moment? And then the rest of the panel, feel free to jump in. 